All right, so welcome back into the metaverse today. We're going to dive into social media and kind of the evolution of what Web3 and the connection into the social sphere might look like, including the metaverse. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to Metaverse Insider. Joining me today is Elliot Hill, who's the director of comms over at Veracity. We had a chance to kind of do a shout out. The communities came together and the Veracians are strong, Elliot. <laughs> I must say that for sure. But anyway, welcome to the show. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, Paul. It's really, really great to be here. Yeah, I wanted to sort of preface before we got into it. Um, a big thank you to our community who I think probably made this happen with the, with the power of Twitter and the diamond circle. They did. So yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> awesome. So big shout out to the Verasian community. Yeah, no, it was really good. I mean, we, it's good to hear the community uh, really kind of show that they're interested in getting answers and questions, you know, because doing deep dive interviews and, and AMAs like what we've done here on our show for quite some time, those are really some of the most popular videos and they continue to, to get a lot of demand. You know, sometimes it's just difficult to do as many uh, requests as we get. But hey, let's get into Veracity and the overall ecosystem itself. It, first of all, for some of our new viewers and some people maybe who do not understand Metaverse Web3, explain a little bit more about what Veracity is trying to do. Yeah, for sure. It's a great question. And actually, the way that I've um, explained Veracity when, when being on podcasts has actually evolved since I joined the organization back in January. So we're a whole ecosystem, essentially, and we have many different product verticals. So you can see there along the top, we've got some uh, esports verticals, ad tech verticals. We're exploring NFTs. But our core vertical and what brings it all together is our proof of view module. So essentially, we are a patented anti-fraud solution. We use the blockchain for some of these components, and I think we're going to get into it a little bit later. But the whole of Veracity's um, like proof of concept is centered around the uh, ad fraud problem. So the ad fraud problem has sort of erupted into the public consciousness recently with, with the Twitter discussions and Elon Musk. Um, right. But ad fraud is like a $65 billion a year, a year problem in the US alone. And it's basically uh, fake views um, of mm -hmm. ads that are served across video content um, within social media and all of these different kinds of platforms. And what Veracity does is we take our ad tech stack, which is Veraviews, and we prevent the views, uh, the fraudulent views by bots before they can be counted as a real view. So then within that, we've got um, loads of different spin off things that we can do to support the adoption of that ad tech stack. So that's how Vera Esports was born. Vera Esports was born because we saw how big the esports space was going to be. Um, esports viewership has actually overtaken the NBA, right. and they think that um, you know by 2025 it's going to be one of the most consumed modes, of, like uh, sports, um, in the world, especially by younger generations. And Vera Esports uh, is our platform that we're using to generate esports tournament content. And on the back of that, we can provide ads embedded within this content, and then we can test and stress test our Vera Views ad tech stack. We're then going to use this data to take to our partners, our enterprise partners on the advertising side and say, for instance, look, we've pushed 100K views a day, which is actually our, our target, 100K views a day, uh, and we've got zero incidences of ad fraud. So that's how that links. On the back of Vera Esports, we've got the Veriverse NFT marketplace coming out. The Veriverse NFT marketplace um, is going to be a one-stop shop for all things like esports related and NFT esports. So you'll be able to have like in-game skins, in-game items. But within that, we're going to have our proof of view module that prevents fraud at the point of NFT. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit later and how uh, yeah, for sure. fraud is transforming nfts but that's sort of like a top-down view of our ecosystem and actually um i haven't spoken about this before and it's probably going to be the first i've shared here on on uh this podcast but we're actually building out a few more uh, modules as well around the vera wallet so we're going to have perhaps vera pay um and then obviously the vera verse is coming in as well so, all right, so you heard it here first on uh, Metaverse Insider is, I like the fact that uh, we see a lot of projects that are really starting to kind of double down, especially within the Metaverse, obviously with uh, esports and, and kind of the whole aspect of view verification um, and your you know, whole concept, proof of view work. 
Let's talk about that a little bit. But before I jump into that, I'm just kind of curious, how big is your team? So at the moment, we've got um, 40 full-time team members. So obviously, okay. there's the management team on our website. Um, I'm working hard to get all the rest of the team members on there. We're a very decentralized team. We all work completely remotely, uh, but we do meet up regularly in, in London, at least the UK-based team does. Um, so I was actually in London yesterday with our founder, uh, RJ Mark, and uh, Justin, our CRO, um, mm -hmm. and also a new member of the team who actually I'm pretty sure uh, will have already welcomed him by the time time we air. So uh, we, I was with Dan as well, who is our new director of business development. So we do okay. regularly meet up to discuss strategy. Um, and yeah, even though we're all remote, things just seem to work and power on and we keep shipping products and code. So. Yeah, we've seen so many uh, companies and, and projects that are, you know, completely remote. In many cases, you know, they're in different, you know, parts of the world. I mean, in, in literally 15 hours apart kind of thing. Uh, so it's uh, kind of interesting to see the, um, just the, you know, I think the overall scope of what we've seen in terms of metaverse and kind of the explosion of blockchain and Web3. Let's get into uh, proof of view because proof of view, and this is something that, you know, I've been in media for 20 plus years. Um, you know, was birthed in the social media era, got to grow with the tech industry, got a, was right there on the birth of mobile. And I've, you know, we've built media companies left and right. And, you know, it's a big problem. You know, the issue of ad fraud, the issue of uh, bot views, bot downloads on podcasts, all the kind of things that, you know, advertisers complain about. But, you know, the biggest offender I would still have to say is Google, you know, which is doing a complete amount of evil in the sense of just what we're seeing with that. And you guys are trying to address address this. So proof of view, explain how this works and how would your team of 40 people be able to kind of crack the code here when we've seen companies uh, multiple size of this fail on trying to control ad fraud? Yeah, it's a huge problem. I would say it also disproportionately affects uh, the publisher, as you said. So on your mm -hmm. side, you've been a, a content creator. And I think, you know, advertisers can just scale up or scale down their ad spend. Exactly. But when they encounter fraud, consistent fraud, they scale back their ad spend. And that disproportionately affects publishers, especially small scale publishers. So yeah. I think... The question you had there about, you know, why have other companies tried and failed? There's loads of ad fraud prevention uh, protocols out there, but there's none that are really based on blockchain. So we have an, an on-chain element which sort of um, injects this degree of transparent uh, transparency across uh, AdServe. So basically we make it so that both publishers and advertisers can see real AdServe um, on the blockchain. So the proof of view module itself is a patented anti-fraud solution. Um, and we mainly deploy that at the moment across video content. So proof of view detects and eliminates ad fraud by only sending valid views to the blockchain. And then these valid views cannot be manipulated because it's immutable. Um, we use a side chain of Ethereum, so it's on a really robust platform, tried and tested. Um, and as part of the proof of view module, uh, we have a few different phases. So how it actually works, we've got the initial phase, which is where a user would land um, on a, a video or a site and proof of view as a module with the rest of the Veriview's ad tech stack um, attempts to recognize that viewer um, according to their pre-filtering score. So this will be as they've navigated through the internet and they've accrued cookies. You know, we can already begin to tell from that uh, from their history, web history, mm -hmm. um, if they're a real user or a bot. Um, and this happens at the point before the ad, uh, the ad impression, sorry, is served. And then we have the viewing phase. So proof of view will then gather statistics on viewer behavior, um, and it provides the viewer's devices with proprietary challenges. So these are quite common to um, all ad stacks in the industry, like any ad fraud solution uses a lot of these components. These proprietary challenges will do like uh, human checks, a little bit like capture, but it happens in the background. Right. 
that they'll check that you're actually you have the window open that you're actually viewing the video you haven't minimized the screen and this sort of stuff um we don't challenge the viewer this all happens totally automatically and and it doesn't interrupt the actual ad impression process and then we have a scoring phase so all of this is happening simultaneously and it's happening within milliseconds so proof of view analyzes the data gathered from the phase one and two there that we just spoke about. Um, and it uses proprietary uh, artificial intelligence um, to basically score each user to check that they are a real viewer. Um, and then it takes IVT filtering data from third party detection vendors who, you know, they ad fraud is their business. Um, and then it gives all users a score. But the magic happens, and this is where we, you know, move ahead from other ad fraud prevention technologies. The magic happens that this data is stored as hashes on the Vera chain, which is a side chain of Ethereum. Now, what that means is that um, typically, and I'm sure you know as a, as a publisher, if you were to go to an advertiser and say, we had uh, 700,000 views today, they'd say, okay, um, we think 20% of those are likely to be fraudulent. So that's 20% of your revenue gone. Even if you knew that 100% of them were real, there's no real way for you to actually prove that as a publisher. But with bear reviews, it's stored on the blockchain. So publishers can take that transparent data ledger, show it to advertisers. Advertisers get a better deal because they know that their ad spend is being spent correctly and they know that it's right. not being viewed by bots. And publishers get paid quicker and there's less, you know, um, I guess, challenges there with actually getting paid mm -hmm. for, the, for the ads that they've served. So it's really powerful for both parties. Obviously, it's going to increase revenue from ad spend. But it's also going to decrease payment times for publishers. Yeah. Okay. So you you unpacked a lot there. You know, I, first of all, I think the fact that there is some AI that's uh, assisting that we've seen companies kind of go in this direction in the past. One kind of curious uh, area that you know that we've discovered over the years is that you know once you sidestep the bots, then you have the human farms, which are mm -hmm. you know, I, and I've seen these in the Philippines, you know, on on videos and things of that nature, in researching how ad fraud is being done. And um, it's one thing to kind of watch this and I mean, where they're putting tens of thousands of people on a 24 hour cycle where they're cycling, you know, tens of thousands of mobile devices, computers, um, iPad, you name it, the kind of devices to give you a variety. How do you overcome that? Because that to me seems like one of the biggest challenges, including what we've seen on Twitter, because the amount of bots that we see on the Twitter views is pretty heavily, I would say, is very heavy in comparison to engagement numbers, because that's the thing that we look at mostly. You get something like a video that gets 10,000 views on Twitter, but the engagement is like a fraction, because nobody's mm -hmm. really watching that video. So how would Veracity solve that, that issue? Yeah, that is a, a really good point. And I've seen these pictures of, of, like you say, engagement farms with like one person sitting in front of a wall mm -hmm. of phones, just, <laughs> just clicking things. Yeah. I mean, all of those um, sort of farms. So bots are, bots are still the most prevalent and they're still the most sophisticated sure. really with how yeah. like a botnet evades. Um, and that's why there was, there's a really interesting report. I cited pretty, pretty regularly that they think that, um, ad botnets um, for advertising fraud are going to become one of the biggest avenues for like organized crime by 2030. But yeah, yeah. in terms of the actual physical people sitting there and, and farming uh, views, farming engagement, they would all put like what we would call touch points. So they would put data out there without knowing. So whether that's all of those that, um, all of that engagement is coming from the same IP or all of that engagement is happening within a specific time scale or, or they're all on the same OS or simply they're cycling through views too quickly and they can start to build a picture. And this is where the artificial intelligence and machine learning comes in. And we can start yeah. to build a picture of, okay, all of the traffic originating from this area or this geographic region, you know, quite specifically because it's in a certain IP range or they're all using the same operating system or something like that. Um, they are deemed to be fraudulent. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's going to be um, somewhat harder than, than a bot because, you know, they're obviously 
I mean, humans at this point, at least, are still smarter than bots for the most part. Yeah. Um, obviously, I guess that depends on on the person. But um, yeah, it's it's going to be more difficult. But I think there is definitely things you can do within the traditional ad tech stack um, that would throw up these anomalies and re- make you think, right, okay, they've like they've gone on, uh, they've opened the video, they've minimized it instantly, and from the mm-hmm. same IP, there's like. 300 other instances of the video open it's all minimized so we can say that that's fake um obviously it's sort of like a digital arms race at the moment i think this is yeah, what right. elon, elon musk was talking about a little bit that to, to actually keep on top of the bot problem is incredibly difficult and um it's really interesting what you said there about um the twitter engagement because there's a really popular theory going around on the internet at the moment maybe in some fringe forums but about the dead internet theory that in actual mm-hmm. fact like uh, 75% of the internet is just driven by bots and the amount of actual people watching and engaging with videos and content is super super low and it's worrying really like um bit like skynet i guess for terminator like we've got Mm -hmm. to wrestle back control i think (laughs) (laughs) all right so i want to thank our sponsor today that is celsius who has 1.7 million people who call celsius their home for crypto join them to buy swap borrow earn send and store crypto all in one app with zero fees the best rates and human customer service head over to celsius.network to get started today Do remember that Celsius is not available in all places, so make sure and check out your own jurisdiction and you guys can figure that out. One thing I do like about Celsius, probably one of the best features I like, is their loan program. And borrowing starting at 0.1% APR is, I think, the best in the industry. And if you are looking at trying to take loans on crypto to be able to leverage up, this is one of those strategies and one of the products out there that I use on a day-in, day-out basis. Full disclosure, big user of Celsius, and I love it throughout. Also, remember, if you guys want to use our link below, it helps the channel out. So check out Celsius.network. When you think about that, so data-wise, you guys, you explained how you're tracking viewers, uh, a little bit how you're gathering data. What is the tool set? Is it a browser interface? Is it uh, an integrated, you know, um, applet that's downloaded on the mobile device? How, how does Veracity mm-hmm. plug in so that it can actually do these things? Yeah, so we actually have third-party integration. So we've got an API at the moment, which can be deployed mm-hmm. across a lot of different video players. Um, but what we're m- building on and what we're putting, I guess, most of our eggs in the basket of is the integration of Veraviews as an actual ad tech stack. Um, mm-hmm. So at the moment, our Veraviews ad tech stack is integrated in brightcove so brightcove are one of the world's biggest publishing networks they have the brightcove marketplace and on the brightcove marketplace at the moment you can go there if you're a publisher um, you can search for veraviews and it'll come up with the veraviews ad tech stack at the moment that is deployed and integrated entirely within our own uh, player which is called vera player now, Vera Player is it's a powerful video player and it has Vera Views built in. But the challenge that we've got at the moment is actually getting people, and I'm sure you, you know this and, and appreciate this from a publisher side, getting those publishers to adopt our player is going to be very difficult when they're on yeah. like JW pay, Player, when yeah. they're using um, Brightcove's native player. So instead of doing that, we've pivoted our, our focus onto actually having like our ad tech stack exclusively built into the Brightcove player. So essentially all of the publishers on Brightcove and they have like 3000 publishers will be able to turn Veraviews on or off at the flick of a switch. So they can choose to use our ad tech stack to protect their advertise, uh, their, their advertising inventory. Every ad they serve through the Brightcove player can be protected by Veraviews. That's going to be finished. The integration of that is going to be finished by the end of Q2. And we've already made um, significant progress on that. And that's a really exciting and it's going to be a really exciting milestone for us because it's going to really allow us to easily get new publishing partners. As I said as well uh, earlier, Dan has come on to help us basically sell the Veraviews ad tech stack. 
not only to Brightcove publishers, but to publishers right. outside of Brightcove as well. So they could use the Vera player. Um, and we're also going to explore integrations for Vera views within like other players. So that could be JW player or APIs for other media players. Yeah, a lot of people don't really understand this uh, today, but for most websites out there, there's a host of, of different player models out there that kind of circumvent beyond YouTube. We've used JW, we've used Wistia, you know, a variety, including Brightcove, but most of those are pretty heavy expenses to publishers because in most cases it's on, you know, the demand sequence of how much you're getting. It's not like YouTube where YouTube has, has an unlimited bandwidth of being able to deliver content. But you get into content delivery networks and it starts to change things up a little bit. Why not go the route of a browser plugin, something like what Brave is doing or even Opera with their new crypto browser and, and plug it in in an essence to where, especially based on the data that you're saying that you collect, or at least to be able to measure, you know, if someone's viewing a video on any kind of platform, whether it's YouTube or any of those kind of things where you could register uh, certain levels of quality and accuracy. Any plans for something like that? It's something we've explored, and I think the Brave solution is is really, really interesting that we've got this. Um, you know, obviously, they have the Brave rewards as well, so they actually reward people right. for viewing any any kind of ad. Um, obviously, Brave have got, like, a, a decent bit of market share there with the retail community mm -hmm. already. So, you know, I personally use Brave, and I use Brave rewards. But then on the other side, there's a whole host of, like, um, professional publishers who are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have absolutely, you spoke there about content delivery networks, CDNs, mm -hmm. and they have yep. a vast amount of content on these CDNs, existing content and video on demand content. They also bring out live content. Um, so like one of the users of like, say, Bright Cove, um, one of which is, is like Sky, for instance, their content um, catalog is absolutely enormous. And they're basically looking for like a really easy, plug and play ad tech stack that they can just turn on within the uh, within the video player that they're already using. So that's our yeah. core focus at the moment is how do we bring our solution to enterprise users? We may then explore, you know, on the back of that when we've got enterprise users actively using uh, Veraviews out of beta and, you know, we're down the line with proving how effective it is um, and we think it is very effective then we could look at maybe deploying like a retail solution for that or something that sits in a, a browser yeah, and, and prevents ads uh, across all ads. But for now, uh, like, um, sorry, prevents fraud across all ads. But for now, our core focus is on like enterprise use for video on demand content, yeah. um, which is part which of the Which is going to be the big plug. Forward. That's going to be the big publishers yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, that's in most cases, that's a, a ton of content delivery that you're you're talking about, whether it's someone like a Forbes or a New York Times or, you know, a lot of these who are dealing with, you know, ridiculous level ad budgets, you know, especially in this case. So I do I do see the market for it, and definitely as we start to kind of escalate into some of the other social media uh, platforms. But Google and Twitter, still to this day, have you know, and I think this can be argued many different ways, a certain amount of those ads are being delivered to bots. We, we mm. pretty much know this now. You know, the discovery and what kind of what Elon has done with his uh, attempted and what might be the true acquisition of Twitter is a lot of due diligence on really understanding what that ecosystem looks like on, on what real, you know, advertising dollars are, you know, from a brand awareness standpoint. Why would Google... And Twitter wants something like this because I feel like this is going to cut a large percentage of their ad revenues out of the unbeknownst advertisers that do not realize they're getting bot views or downloads, you know. Yeah, well, this is like um, this is probably one of, I think, the biggest challenges in the industry, like obviously. Mm -hmm. Networks that deliver content, be it social media or like the likes of YouTube and that sort of stuff, obviously they are somewhat incentivized. I wouldn't say they they do it, um, you know, wholeheartedly on purpose, but they're sort of incentivized to give higher view of ship metrics because it looks better right. to advertisers. They're going to get more campaigns. However, mm -hmm. I think if we're talking about the longevity of advertising as a whole industry, that's simply not sustainable. Elon yeah. Musk has really brought to the forefront some of the deeper um, conversations that I think we need to have as an industry. Um, 
is Twitter's you know current um, revenue really sustainable when advertisers start saying, okay, we're throwing millions and millions of dollars at your platform per year and we think we're only getting like i mean some of the the percentages that were being thrown out there was like maybe only 30 odd percent of of adverts actually getting seen by real people eventually i think it's uh short-sighted to think that advertisers finance and marketing teams of these multi-billion dollar you know uh plus fortune 500 uh companies are not going to realize that they're throwing ad spend down the drain. And all they're going to do is say, okay, we're going to move to a a platform or we're going to move somewhere where we know we're getting better money for our ad serve. Maybe that's moving more of their adverts back onto TV or moving more of their adverts even back into print where you know that if someone buys a magazine, chances are they're going to read it. Um, And we need that assurance on the internet they need to know that if someone uses a platform, they're going to see an ad and it's not going to be seen by like a fake, like a, yeah. a bot or something like that. And Twitter Let, do have some things. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to get it. I, I would agree to you, to your point is that there are going to be an evolution of ecosystem. We're, we're starting to see this now, even here on our own channel and within our own network is that I feel like we're finding the true audience, you know, for our shows for our network, because uh, we extend um, the way our audience connects with us into a thing called the Diamond Circle, which is our private member group. We see a massive amount of people that are moving into that because they get you know some additional premium stuff. There's some ways to kind of draw that true user into uh, a facility like that versus these mass distribution funnels, which are really kind of Google, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, Meta. But that being the case, do you feel like that we might be seeing now with Web3 and the ability to have true KYC aspects within this of plugging KYC into some sort of identity protocol, maybe not the person, but at least to know that it's a real human and not a bot, uh, at least a KYC protocol that could eliminate this, especially as you look into things like metaverse, gaming, other kinds of things that are eventually going to be a scenario that I, I would see, you know, in the next 10 years, we'll probably have enough AI bots out there that could initiate gameplay. And and within that gameplay, you've got advertising delivery, maybe the kind of scenario that we're already seeing, you know, with uh, play and earn that could be played into this. What about going in, in that direction where KYC or some sort of identity protocol could really kind of map this out? Yeah, and I mean, something like this has got to happen, right? Because we're going cookie-less now, so cookie-less is yeah. going to be a thing maybe in the next couple of years that we're going to see the phase out of cookies so we're not going to have those sort of um user tracking capabilities to see who is a real person and who's not a bot. In terms of KYC, I think that would be absolutely applicable in the Western world. I think we also yeah. need to look to maybe developing nations who, you know, their their ad spend and their, their budget, you know, their, their GDP is increasing. The populations of developing companies, uh, countries, sorry, are becoming more like upwardly mobile. They want to, uh, they have more disposable income. And I would wonder if like a wholesale KYC solution uh, across like the whole internet uh, where we need people to prove they're a real human, I think that could maybe cause some issues in developing nations where access to like identification isn't so easy. Like maybe we take it for granted here in the West. Um, but then there's some really interesting things happening uh, with like blockchain protocols like uh, Ethereum and Cardano, where we have, um, you know, like decentralized identification credentials right and i think if we manage to merge the two so people can easily create like a a blockchain based online id um and then they can you know have that logged in across the internet um then that could be you know really uh powerful for advertising i think probably google suite and all the google family of products is sort of like a progenitor to that albeit centralized you know we already log in with our google accounts everywhere if we can have something similar, but based on the blockchain that, you know, you prove your identity once by uploading identity documents, um, and then it follows you everywhere you go on the web. I think that could definitely be a, a powerful use case. 
I wonder how it'll look like with with data protection and and um, exactly going to be yeah a, yeah mm -hmm. which could be I think that's a, a good thing as we start to see that whether you look at you know what's happening within Europe and the EU around data protect protection a lot of this has been born from the Web two problems that we've had you know so I think Web three we actually just reported on this not uh, this week uh, where Vitalik um, was you know Vitalik Buterin was talking about mm -hmm. souls which is an identity mechanism that's going to ride on the Ethereum blockchain that might be able to do that without the ability to say, hey, it's Paul Barron here, but I'm going through a certain step of protocols to be able to prove that I'm a human and not a bot, you know, and having some sort of certification, kind of like what you're referencing there. So I see all of this definitely changing in Web3. With, with Web3, let's, let's kind of go this direction now. You, you guys clearly have a solution that's leaning into Web3, Metaverse, gaming with esports and your activity there within esports obviously authenticity is going to be a real thing and the likelihood of our challenges that we've had in web 2 do you think we're going to replicate that in web 3 all over again with just maybe some new toys or <laughs> or do you think we're going to solve this problem um as someone who's worked in blockchain for like the last you know 6 years i would like to think that we are building things differently from the beginning um, in terms of like what we're actually building at Veracity, the, the Web3 element isn't going to be on the user side, like we are just talking mm -hmm. about there, having user pro, uh, protocols. I think that would require us to do a lot of um, you know, zero-knowledge proofs and, and research into that and how we kept user uh, data safe. Instead, it's going to be very much on the Web3 of having like a single unified wallet for a whole range of like product verticals and ecosystem services. So we've got the Vera wallet, which I guess is our Web3 application. Um, it is sort of within our sites to, to explore making that like a, a traditional Web3 wallet. Um, so the Vera wallet is a digital um, wallet where you can store VRA at the moment. Um, yeah. And we have in there, we have our staking program. That's also going to be integrated into uh, Veraverse, which is our NFT marketplace upcoming for like uh, the second half of 2022. And it's also integrated into Vera Esports, so you can log in with Vera Wallet. Um, and as part of Vera Wallet now, we are actually rolling out automated KYC. So we're going to be working with some substance. They're a really trust and, trusted and tried and tested KYC provider. Um, and yeah, we're going to be requiring some users, you know, depending on a bit, a little bit like an exchange, depending on what level of um, user they are to, to go through certain KYC steps. And as our community yeah. knows, some of them already have to do that. And I think that's where it'll be like, We'll have we'll start to have, and this is like as an industry as a whole, not specifically veracity. And I think we're already seeing this, but we'll start to have a single wallet which will enable logins. You can store identity documents there. You can store credentials. You can go and buy an NFT and store it in the wallet. You can that store will be your assets huge. in the wallet. Yeah, and I think we're <laughs> yeah, already sort of seeing huge. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, For sure. absolutely. It really. What's would, the staking yeah. rewards right now on on VRA? So our staking rewards are eighteen point two five percent, which you know seems at, when you uh, drop on the website it seems really high even for DeFi. Mm -hmm. But we've actually locked that in from our like uh, you know like our token raise back in the back in two thousand eighteen, um, and we have like a staking wallet that we maintain um, so we can lock that rate in. So that's locked in until April twenty twenty three. Uh, so we revise it each year. Um, so yeah, we, I mean, I state my VRA through the Vera wallet. Um, so yeah, you can go and, and take advantage of that staking rate today, which I think during a bear market is, is really quite uh, advantageous, you know? Yeah. Like I think if you're not going to, if you're not going to sell your crypto, which I hope no one uh, watching this is, if you believe in the future of the industry, it's one of those times where all the crypto holders get their heads down and stake and all the crypto yep. teams get their heads down and build. And you know, build. I've been here before in 2018 and it very much feels like, um, although the markets don't reflect it, there's so much innovation going on. Um, so mm -hmm. I feel like we're sort of in that spot at the moment. Yeah, I think the uh, you know, and we'll continue. I think we'll continue to see kind of this direction of innovation a lot. And to your point, everybody has been talking about you know building on it for sure. Okay, so I'm trying to put together the pieces here because I, I see veracity. We've talked about it. We've had it on our token watch for quite some time. 
Uh, it's ranked many times in our top 30 metaverse tokens. Uh, so we've, we've known in and around what you're, you guys are up to. And I look at the business model and kind of the overall architecture of where you guys are going. It's very clear, you know, from a player standpoint, especially from big publishers, and eventually getting into maybe traditional media, you know, what we call traditional media today, internet, you know, mm. those kind of things. I definitely see the track there. Explain to me the connection and the leap into esports. Obviously, crypto gaming will play a part of that, but also in the metaverse, because to me, metaverse is almost going to be as important in a decade as like YouTube and a lot of these social media platforms are today. You know, 10 years from now, we'll be in a completely new environment. Within that kind of framework, we're going to need that kind of authentication. Is, is Veracity planning a, a big charge into the metaverse to secure that kind of uh, authenticity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our foray into the metaverse really comes through in uh, our activity around the NFT marketplace, which is Veriverse. So that's going to host um, metaverse content in that it's going to have like in-game items. So that could be, you know, in in-game items for a metaverse universe. Mm -hmm. This was this like whole product vertical was sort of born out of our discussions with uh, AAA games publishers, who basically um, said, you know, we we want to explore NFTs, but the infrastructure is not there. And I think some people watching this this uh, podcast will uh, probably recognise this as one of my favourite like um, uh, yeah stories to tell about where I think we are with the adoption of NFTs, but. Um, the first internet-enabled games console was made by Apple, and it was the Apple Pippin. Um, it yeah. came out many years before like other internet-enabled games consoles, and it was a total flop. And it wasn't a total flop because internet gaming wasn't um, you know, a revolution. As we know now, internet gaming is the de facto way that everyone plays games. And it also wasn't a flop because the Apple Pippin you know, sucked. It was a flop because everyone at home had like dial up internet or they had really poor yeah. internet and we just didn't have the infrastructure there. And that's where NFTs have existed up until this point. I think that although they're a great idea and they offer tons of value um, and, you know, there's a huge appetite from games publishers for NFTs, there just mm -hmm. hasn't been the infrastructure. And personally, with my sort of like business head on, I think some of the bigger games platforms that have said no we're not looking into nfts at all i think maybe they're secretly building out some infrastructure in the background so that yeah. they're ready to jump on that when it matures so that's where our foray into the into the metaverse will be in nfts and part of that is going to be tailoring our proof of view module uh, which is patented of course to prevent ad fraud um, on video content, but we can also embed it within a smart contract at the point of mint for an NFT as well. So we're going to basically prevent NFT fraud. And what that'll look like is someone couldn't go and mint an NFT of an artwork that um, already exists. So right now, right. someone could take um, a bored ape and they could take the JPEG and they could just go to another protocol and mint it again and say, this is my NFT, this is my artwork prove it's not now a lot of protocols will let you mint that artwork um, but once proof of view is live and on veriverse we'll use our, our back, back end vera vault which we're going to deploy in synergy with the veriverse um, it's going to comb the internet essentially and it's going to use proof of view and our ai stack within proof of view um, and it's going to say no sorry that was printed months ago you can't yeah, print that exactly. on that protocol and we think that could be a really powerful like industry standard a little bit like having you know those shiny uh, codes on a bottle of wine that says it's from a certain geographic region we would have that protection for nfts so that's where our like sort of route into the metaverse is going i don't think that we're going to look um into like advertising in the metaverse yet we may look at in-game advertising um i think in terms of, of fraud for metaverse advertising, um, I actually think that, you know, seeing as you have to be there and you have to be playing, it's going to be a lot easier to identify that people are real. Um, but yeah. I'm sure that in a few years, they'll find some clever way of, of uh, defrauding people in the metaverse yeah. as well. So I'm concerned we about will AI. Stay on top of that. 
yeah, mm-hmm. AI when yeah. it comes to <laughs> things like that. Back to your point on NFTs, though. You know, we've even had that issue uh, here on our own network. We had people launching NFTs on OpenSea that were for PBN for our own network and myself. And we had to go into OpenSea, you know, go through a whole process of takedowns. I mean, it was a real, it was a real issue, mm-hmm. uh, and it and it continues to be this. So I think, uh, you know, some sort of verification and 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 or an authenticity system for NFTs as this really kind of scales up. Because really, to our point and your point, is that right now it's in its infancy. We haven't even begun to see what NFTs are going to do. What we've seen so far is literally, like you explained with the Pippin. It's a real growth category that I think is still completely untouched uh, and is going to be very interesting. And it's only going to scale. And, and that's going to be the problem is when it does scale, fraud is going to run rampant, you know, because it's just like, you know, it's just like with the Internet. It's looked like social media. When social media first stopped, fraud just began running rampant within Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube. It was it was bad. We think it was bad today. You know, when you look back at 2007 to 2010, that was a really bad problem uh, that we had because Twitter especially just opened up the gates of hell, I felt like, in, in terms of creating what, what they have right now. So it's interesting. Hey, this has been a good one. Um, always love to dive in deep on these projects, get a lot of answers. I think, Elliot, you gave us a lot on Veracity, where you guys are going. Uh, definitely want to keep you uh, close to the channel because as you guys develop more stuff in your roadmap, uh, we want to get you back on and talk more in depth around uh, the future of Veracity. But thanks for stopping in. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having us, Paul. And uh, can't, can't wait to, uh, to speak to you again. All right. Okay, so you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Listen, we have another podcast. It's called Tech Path Crypto. You can also search it, whether you're over on Spotify or iTunes. But the best way to really kind of experience the whole show is right here on YouTube. And it's the number one way that you can help the channel out. Make sure and like and subscribe. But right now, this is the thing you have to do. It really helps us and the algorithm so we get real people watching our show and not the bots and the challenges that we face here uh, within you know, this whole media aspect. If you guys want to reach me, hit me up on Bot Laden Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on Metaverse Insider. 